sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We have times in our lives, like maybe when we first come to faith in Jesus, maybe when we have recently rededicated our life to Christ, maybe simply when life is good and everything is going well. Times when everything, including our faith, seems to make sense. The world is good. Life is stable. Or at least everything is headed in the right direction. You feel like you're making spiritual progress. Maybe even things are going so well that you're not paying much attention to your spiritual life at all because things are going so well it doesn't seem like you have to. But then life throws you a curveball. I don't mean the bad curveball that I tried to throw when I was a kid. I mean a Clayton Kershaw curveball, one that starts out looking like it's coming at your head, and as you're bailing out of the batter's box, it drops into the strike zone for a strike. Or it looks like it's coming right down the middle of the plate, and you swing at it, and you feel foolish as you have just struck out on a pitch that was down in the dirt. In real life, maybe this means you lost a job or a relationship, a family member got sick, or you got sick. Someone you love dies. You go through a divorce. Maybe it just seems like everything is changing around you and you can't keep up and you can't keep track of it all because it's all happening so fast. Like it's like how it's felt for many of us the last five and a half months. And it's disorienting. Whatever it is that went wrong, whatever was the precipitating cause, something has gone very wrong. You are experiencing a trauma. You're experiencing a crisis. So you start to question your beliefs, your worldview or your mindset. You question everything that you've been taught and the assumptions that up until now helped you make sense out of the world. Your understanding of how the world works is in flux. And with that, I'd like to read from Psalm 13. For the director of music, it's a Psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Like David in Psalm 13, you might cry out, How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? Because it seems like God is gone. This kind of psalm, a cry for help, technically referred to as a lament, is actually the most common type of psalm in the book. One third of the psalms are laments. Crying out to God in one way or another because it now seems like everything you thought was wrong. And the world isn't working for you anymore and God is not doing anything about it. Now, if you're honest with yourself, maybe you're the one who messed up. But you expect God to rescue you and it doesn't feel like God is rescuing you yet. We're in the second week of a five-week series on the Psalms. Last week, we looked at Psalm 1. Psalm 1 encourages us to delight in God's word, to meditate on it day and night, to seek God's will for our lives, to orient our whole lives toward God, and to live a God-centered life. If Psalm 1 was a song of orientation, of your life being oriented toward God, of living a God-centered life, then the Psalms, the songs or psalms of lament, like Psalm 13, are psalms of disorientation, psalms of being confused, turned around, disappointed, 
not knowing where the center is and crying out to God. The Psalms of, of lament typically start with a complaint. Here's what's wrong, God. In Psalm 13, it's how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? You've hidden your face from me. I thought I was doing all the right stuff. I thought I was on the right track, but I'm in trouble and I don't feel your presence. Where did you go? I'm angry, sad, depressed, scared, frustrated, and confused, maybe beyond description. It seems like nothing is working out for me right now. I don't know if this problem can ever be fixed. How long is this going to go on? Professor Rolf Jacobson, who lost his legs to cancer as a teenager, says that the worst period of his life was when, as a teen, he was in the hospital while the doctors were trying unsuccessfully to save his legs. Every day a doctor would come in and say, well, you can't go home today. And that went on for a month. At several points of the last six years of my wife Gail's life, I wondered how long it would be until Gail and I could get back to normal, until our lives weren't dominated and controlled by the people who scheduled her doctor appointments. And especially over the last year and a half of her life, we often thought or hoped and prayed, even if we didn't think it was true, that the next treatment she, she was starting would be the thing that would help us get back to normal. How long can this keep going on? And eventually it turned out the answer to how long can this keep going on was the rest of her life. Now, how long can be a literal question, or it can simply be an expression of frustration or exasperation. It's a form of prayer that arises out of the pit. I think about Joseph being down in the pit, thrown down there by his brothers, and wondering, how long am I going to be down here, and how am I going to get out? It's a form of prayer that arises from despair. The crisis, the moment when you're not sure if you're going to survive. But this kind of prayer also asks God for something. It is a cry for help, for rescue, for deliverance. The ask is important. The Psalms, I believe, raise the question of why it is that we bother to pray. Think about the Lord's Prayer and just say this one line with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in large part because we are praying that our wills and our lives will be aligned with God. That God's will will be done and God's kingdom will come in our lives. But we also pray at least sometimes, because we're asking God to do something. We're asking God for help. These lament psalms, like Psalm 13, give us permission to go to God with our deepest fears, our deepest pains, our frustrations, and even anger. Did you know that? It's okay even to be angry at God. David was. And because God is a relational God, because God wants to be in relationship with us, and being in relationship changes people, we believe that at least sometimes our prayers will be answered in a way, a way that is because God was motivated to act when God might not have acted without our prayers. In Exodus, for example, God hears the cries of God's people, the Hebrews, and God raises up a leader, Moses, to lead them out of Egypt into the Promised Land. So the question, or the complaint, might be, how long will this keep going on? But the complaint is followed by a request, by an ask. Consider me and answer me, David says. Give light to my eyes. 
You know what's going on, Lord. Help me out here, would you? Verse 4 of Psalm 13 appears to be David's feeble attempt to give God a reason to help him. Don't let my enemies win. To which I think God might have answered, so? But then come verses 5 and 6. David goes on. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. For the first four verses of this psalm, David is crying out to God, how long will this keep going on? I'm dying here. Help me out. Help me, help me, help me, would you? And then come the last two verses of this psalm, which I'm going to read again for emphasis. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In between verse 4 and verse 5, where David says, but I trust in your unfailing love, something happened. But it's not clear what. Did some prophet come and speak to David and tell him that God would rescue him? Did a night or a week or a month or a year in prayer convinced David that God had not actually abandoned him? Did David's circumstances change? Did God do something to rescue him in between there? Well, maybe. But there's no evidence in the psalm that any time has passed. There's no evidence that God has done anything to resolve David's problem. Except that David's attitude has changed. Not everything is fixed. He still has problems, but, and this is a big but, God has changed David. David recognizes that God's love, the Hebrew word is hesed, unconditional or unfailing love, truly is unconditional and unfailing. God has not abandoned David And God will not abandon you. And David trusts God's unfailing, unconditional love. It seems that as an answer to David's prayer, God has grown David's faith. And if you ask, God will grow your faith. David, recognizing that God has not abandoned him in spite of his circumstances, says that he trusts that his his heart actually rejoices in God's salvation and that he will, in the present and the future, sing praises to God because of what God has done for him. David can say or write or sing all of this because of his trust in God's unfailing, unconditional love. The Psalms are prayers. They are, for the most part, human words to God. The lament psalms and other psalms of disorientation give us permission to have real emotions, to feel scared or angry or sad, alone or abandoned, because emotions are real. They are part of life, and we shouldn't try to pretend that we don't have them. These psalms also give us permission to express our emotions, fears, angers, frustrations, and our sadness to God. Yes, the Bible tells us not to be afraid or not to dwell on our anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, for example. But that doesn't mean we'll never be afraid or angry. It just means we can't settle down into that emotion and live in it. By the end of Psalm 13, as short as it is, David is expressing a change, but I trust in your unfailing love. This is a new normal. It's a reorientation, but it's not just back to the old orientation. New Testament scholar Mark Allen Powell calls it finding a new naivete. 
having experienced hardship, having had your expectations scattered or shattered, David has come back to God. David has come to a new understanding of reality. I did a training unit when I was in seminary in the chaplain's office at Loma Linda Hospital. We got a lot of requests for a Catholic priest to come to somebody's room. Well, that almost never happened. There was one Catholic priest. He technically didn't work for the hospital. Uh, he worked for the diocese, and he was at the hospital sometimes. So during that 10-week period that I was in this training unit, a lot of people who asked for a Catholic priest got me. And usually, when I came into the room and introduced myself, they would begin by expressing their disappointment that I had come rather than a Catholic priest. And I don't blame them for that. But then we'd have a conversation anyway. And someplace near the end of the conversation, and it almost always went almost the same, they would say something like, you know, I'm glad you came instead of a Catholic priest because I could tell you things I couldn't have told my priest. And I would say, well, that's interesting. How come? And they would say something like, well, I don't believe all the things that they taught me in catechism class anymore. And I would ask, well, how old were you in, when you took that catechism class where you learned those things that you don't believe anymore? And they'd say eight or 10 years old. And I would ask, do you understand anything the way that you did when you were eight years old? No, of course you don't because you've, you've grown up. You understand things on a much different level than you did when you were eight years old. What they taught you when you were eight was the way that you could understand it when you were eight years old, but now you're a grown adult and you understand things differently. Laments are psalms of disorientation and reorientation, psalms of moving from a childish faith to a mature adult faith, seeking God's will, seeking to live a God-centered life, even when things aren't going right for you, which you can do because you can trust in God's unfailing love. As we move from childlike Sunday school faith to adult faith, we make a kind of transition, just as David does in this psalm. You see, it's easy to believe that if you simply believe in Jesus, Jesus will solve all your problems. But as you get older, as you experience hardship, you figure out that believing in God will not solve all your problems. It's not that if you believe in God, God will make you rich or protect you from all problems and suffering. It's that Jesus will be with you when those problems and those troubles arise. Jesus will be with you in your suffering. And he knows what suffering is because he suffered on a cross. And God will even use your suffering to help you mature as a human being and as a person of faith. The lament songs and other psalms that deal with issues of disorientation don't move us to a quick fix. They don't give us a pat answer. They do, however, suggest a way forward when we're having difficulties in our lives. And that way is pretty simple. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. God got David out of that pit. God parted the Red Sea so the people of Israel could walk through it. They still had to walk but God made the way. You see, this isn't just about how did I get here in the first place? What did I mess up? It's also about trusting God somehow, one way or another, to help you get through whatever the trouble is. In the end, Psalm 13 and the other lament psalms 
are about trusting God with the mature adult faith, not Sunday school faith. You've probably read or heard the poem Footprints, where God says that when you could only see one set of footprints in the sand, that's when God was carrying you. You may think that God has abandoned you, but God is in fact with you. The message of Psalm 13 is that no matter how bad it is, God is with you. And this is the new movement in faith to get beyond the Sunday school or prosperity gospel mentality in order to have a mature adult faith. And as David says in Psalm 19, Psalm 13, sorry, that new adult faith is what motivates us and allows us to both trust and praise God for real. These psalms are important for several reasons. First, they give us words for the deepest, darkest nights of our lives. When the bottom drops out, when the pain seems to be too much to bear. Second, they tell us that God is big enough for everything we've got. God can take our pain, our anger, our questions, our doubts. Then they even go further and they suggest that genuine biblical faith is even willing to challenge God. And they tell us that God is present with us precisely when it feels like God isn't there. Martin Luther says that the mood of this psalm is the state in which hope despairs, and yet despair hopes at the same time. David moves from despair to hope, to trust, and to praise. This is the deep, radical knowledge of faith, which knows that God will not abandon us, that nothing can separate us from God's love, and that we cannot rightly separate God from our experience of life because all of reality is, in fact, God-created and God-centered. By holding together complaint and praise, we see how God is involved in all of life and how the physical and the spiritual worlds are always intersecting with each other. Just as Jesus was forsaken on the cross, but rose, we are simultaneously people of the cross and of the resurrection. There is no following Jesus without bearing a cross. But resurrection power comes to fulfillment in our lives in the midst of our sorrows and our trials and tribulations. Even in despair, you can have hope because you know what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and what God has done for you in your life. And if God's unfailing, everlasting love for you was so great that Jesus Christ became a human being and came into this world to save you and rose from the grave to give you life, you can trust him to be with you even in your moments of doubt and disorientation. Amen.